Greetings, followers of the Eventide. I am Funky Monkey. Welcome to my house of horror! <laughs> and welcome to another Patreon-sponsored review. So then, horror, or at least the life, of the vampire. And it has been a while since last we dove into the Underworld franchise. And today's lucky patron has requested that we return to the dark tale of the Corvinus bloodline and the death dealer Selene. Thus, we arrive at the first sequel, Underworld Evolution. Released in 2006, Underworld Evolution picks up where the first Underworld left off. Death Dealer Selene and Werewolf Vampire Hybrid Michael Corvin face the forces of the last Vampire Elder, Marcus, in a battle for their lives, and the future of dark creatures everywhere. At its release, this movie was critically panned, but currently holds an audience score of 72% on Rotten Tomatoes. So then, my friends, grab your crucifixes and silver stakes and follow me down to the underworld once again, as we have been promised, evolution. After having killed Victor, Celine and Michael are fugitives. So most of what you need to know is already covered in the Underworld 1 review, but in short, Victor was a damn liar and megalomaniac, and vampire society is better off without him. Now there's a lot of ground to cover, so we'll start at the beginning. The surviving elder, Marcus, is actually Marcus Corvinus, progenitor of all vampires. And he is seeking his brother, William, progenitor of all werewolves, who was imprisoned. And Marcus's first act on waking is to eliminate the problem of Craven. We discover the third side in this conflict. Well, didn't you wonder how this war stayed secret all these centuries? Behold the explanation! But Michael Corvin has a problem too. As a creature of the night can no longer stomach our food. Well, Eastern European cooking never looked all that appetising to me. <laughs> Celine moves to intercept, but dawn is breaking. And worse, Marcus has it in his head that Celine has something to answer for. But Celine has a few tricks to lose him, and as dawn breaks, our heroes hold up in an abandoned warehouse. Now, it's around about this point that Michael and Celine consummate their barely restrained emotions. But we're skipping it, because I'm really not all that invested in these characters. Celine remembers a necklace, prompting our heroes to seek out an exiled historian, and despite initial miscommunications, Tanis proves himself most useful. So, remember how Victor thought himself above drinking animal blood, and needed to have human blood, and ended up killing Selene's entire human family, and then blaming it on the lichens? Yeah, well, turns out it wasn't just a random act of bloodthirst. No. Apparently, Celine's father was the one to design William's prison. You remember William Corvinus, progenitor of all werewolves? He was a very angry werewolf. He couldn't even take human form. So, Victor decided that William had to be restrained, imprisoned, and Celine's father was the one who designed that prison. And then Victor killed him and his entire family, except for Celine, for reasons outlined in the Underworld 1 review so that no one would ever find out where this prison was. Some plan, eh? But oh dear, Marcus also picks Tannis's memories. And so are heroes board a boat, and we meet the legendary Corvinus himself. Esteemed viewers, one and all, I present to you Alexander Corvinus, father of the Corvinus bloodline. He had three sons, two we already know about, Marcus, who was bitten by a bat, and William, who was bitten by a wolf. But there was also a third son, 
who has faded into obscurity, having lived a mortal life. It is from this bloodline that Michael Corvin comes. And ever since his sons were bitten, Alexander has somehow remained immortal and cleaned up their messes for century upon century. Now there's a doting father. But Marcus wasn't far behind. And our heroes are no match. And in Celine's blood lies the key to finding William. Marcus does not seek his father's permission, but the other key. There is only one who can defeat Marcus now, and she is given the power of Corvinus blood. The brothers Corvinus are reunited, and Celine's team are too late to stop them. But shock! Michael's alive! And just in time, he re-enters the fray. And so we come to the big final battle, which we're skipping because YouTube, and I kind of find it to be a big damp squib. Michael, who recovered from death, versus William, progenitor of all werewolves, and wins by sort of snapping his head open. And Celine, our death dealer, against Marcus, progenitor of all vampires, and Celine wins by dicing Marcus in a helicopter's blades. Yeah, that's a thing. Which is also very gruesome, and another reason why we're not showing it. But in short, it's the Corvinus brothers versus our protagonists, and our protagonists win. But double shock! Corvinus blood has turned Celine into a daywalker! So then, that was Underworld Evolution. But once more, I really cannot put this one into my house of love. There are two main things in the Underworld franchise that will either draw you in or turn you off completely. Firstly, the amount of blood. There are bucket loads of the red stuff in full effect in this particular instalment. Secondly, the weight of story. Underworld suffered from Originitis, having to set up this entire world and telling the tale of how the war began. Evolution is only slightly less packed, having to set up the brothers called Venus, and introducing the plot hole filling third faction, led by the father of the entire called Venus dynasty, who is somehow still alive. It's dense and dark, visually and tonally, and this movie is almost wall to wall action, so there isn't much space for anyone to give a performance. But the leads do their best with the material, and Tony Curran went out of the bat makeup that is such a large part of his entire performance, very much tries to exude the menace befitting a progenitor of vampires. Sir Derek Jacobi imbues any performance with a certain amount of gravitas, and he is certainly calibre enough for the role of Alexander Corvinus, father of both of the progenitors, and it at least, for the most part, flows evenly, as the narrative, such as it is, moves from A to B, if only to move us towards the next fight, or the big action climax. And I really do like the idea of these two primal forces having actual first incarnations, and not just being manifestations of ancient evil or something stupid like that. But just as in Underworld, too much time is spent on the lore and barely any on characterization. The script is no lighter than Underworld was, and the direction no better. It's complex, bogged down by the weight of its own lore, and then stuffed with semi-pointless action. I'll admit though, that it doesn't feel quite as nasty, not quite as cold this time. Why we even get a love scene in this one? <laughs> so if you're at all invested in this story, you might have the time for Underworld Evolution. But it's gory, sweary, and conversely rather boring in my opinion. No, I'll not be bothering with this one again. So thanks for watching. If you liked this video, why not consider subscribing and ringing the notification bell? And if you want to be extra awesome, check out my crowdfunding links in the description below. But for now, I've been Funky Monkey wishing you better days and better movies. Don't have nightmares!